So did Lucy Letby openly demonstrate many of the traits associated with medical professional serial killers? In this video, I'll be taking you through a short piece written by Catherine Ramsland, Professor of Forensic Psychology, who has looked at a study which examined 90 cases of criminal prosecutions concerning healthcare workers and the common red flag behaviours they exhibited. I'll then be providing examples of Lucy Letby's own behaviour, which I believe backs up these findings. The following is taken from the website Psychology Today, and it states the following here. A study published in the Journal of Forensic Sciences in 2006 examined 90 cases from 20 countries of criminal prosecutions of healthcare professionals between 1970 and 2006. 54 defendants have been convicted. Nurses, male and female, comprised of 86%. From several of these studies and additional cases, we now know that nurses who endangered or killed a number of patients had multiple red flag behaviours. They might have gained macabre nicknames from patients or staff, were in rooms where unexpected deaths occurred and weren't assigned there, were secretive or deceptive about innocuous things, liked to predict that a patient would die, were associated with suspicious incidents at different institutions, craved attention, hung around after a death to experience the reactions, lied about credentials, or falsified their work records or medical access reports. They didn't operate fully under the radar. So in terms of bizarre behaviour, inappropriate behaviour, or simply hanging around after the death of these children, I think one of the shining examples of this would be the case of Child C. Now, in court, the father testified, and he said that during his time with the family, meaning that they were looking after their dying child at this point in time, they knew that he was going to die, they were given privacy, the mother and father were cradling their dying child. He said during the time with the family, they were interrupted by a nurse the father believed to be Lucy Letby. The father recalled the nurse said words to the effect of, you've said your goodbyes now, do you want to put him in here? Meaning a basket. So, bearing in mind, these parents are looking after, as I say, they're caring for their child's last moments, and this nurse comes in, who was later identified as Lucy Letby by the father, and insensitively, I guess is the best way of putting it, said to the parents, you've said your goodbyes now, do you want to put him in here? And I believe the mother turned round and said, he's not dying yet, or he's not dead yet, or something to that effect. She really snapped at Lucy Letby. And the mother and the father, they both said, we remember being really shocked by this. You know, there were a number of nurses, at least one, I think one or two nurses that were popping in periodically to check on how they were. But Lucy Letby would just not leave these parents alone. And this was backed up independently by one of her work colleagues. And it said a nursing colleague had told Letby more than once to look after her designated baby as she had been going in and out of the family room. Mr Johnson, the prosecuting barrister, asks why Letby had a fascination with that room and cites her behaviour as noted in the cases of child I and child P. Mr Johnson said it is not an innocent coincidence. He says Letby, in cross-examination, could not give a plausible reason why she kept going into the family room instead of looking after her designated baby that night. So what this is basically saying here is that Lucy Letby had her own designated baby, her own duties to be getting on with that night, but she would not leave the parents and this dying child alone. Let's take a look at the remarks from the shift leader who testified in court. She said the following. I asked Lucy Letby to focus on a baby in nursery room three, but Letby went into the family room a few times. The nurse recalled asking Lucy Letby to leave the family to Melanie Taylor. The nurse tells the court Letby did not have any designated duties to be in the family room and told her more than once not to be in the family room. So you get the impression here that Lucy Letby has her own duties, her own baby to care for in room three, but Lucy Letby will not stop going back into that family room. And you have to ask yourself, what would be the purpose of that? Now in court, Quite rightly here, Nick, Nicholas Johnson said, well, you've been asked what sort of contribution were you making to this situation, Lucy? You're going into the family room. What helpful contribution were you able to provide this family? And Lucy Letby couldn't answer. 
She couldn't. She didn't say, well, I was going in there to look after them. I was going in there to offer support. She literally had no answer. And you need to ask yourself why that is. And is this actually quite bizarre behavior? Let's then take a look at another case. And this is the case of child I. Now, after this child sadly passed away, the grieving parents agreed to bathe child I. Mr Johnson, the prosecuting barrister, said despite having two designated babies to care for and child I not being her designated baby, let's be met the parents. The mother said, quote, Lucy came back in. She was smiling and kept going on about how she was present at child I's first bath and how much child I had loved it. I wish she had just stopped talking. Eventually, I think she realised and stopped. It wasn't what we wanted to hear. Now, Nicholas Johnson, the prosecuting barrister, went on to say the following, that Lucy Letby's behaviour in the aftermath of Child Eye's death was bizarre and inappropriate. She revelled in what she had done. Her voyeuristic tendencies caused her to look up Child Eye's mother on Facebook. And having killed Child Eye, she wrote a condolence card, which was then later found on her phone when it was seized by police. So again, remember here that this individual actually sent a sympathy card to the parents of child I. This child that she had murdered, she then wrote them a sympathy card and gave it to a colleague who was actually attending the funeral. But what's important to focus on again here is that Lucy Letby has her own duties. She's got a number of babies to be looking after, but she still finds her way to meeting the parents. The mother said Lucy came back in, she was smiling and kept going on about how she was present at Child Eye's first bath and how much Child Eye had loved it. I wish she had just stopped talking. Eventually, I think she realised and stopped. It wasn't what we wanted to hear. Now we move to the case of Child P, where a consultant mentioned the following. Later, a consultant said she remembered another unusual event involving Lucy Letby after Child P had been pronounced dead. She said, quote, I went to speak to the parents. Myself and Lucy Letby were there. I remember feeling I don't know how to face them or how to say this. I told them about Child P that they were going to need a post-mortem. Staff nurse Letby was behind me, and one of the things I found unusual was she was almost very animated. She was saying to the parents, do you want me to make a memory box like I did for Child O yesterday? I remember thinking, this is not a new baby. This is a dead baby. Why are you so excited about this? I found that very inappropriate, the way it was said. What I'm also going to play for you is a very short clip of an interview which was conducted with one of Lucy Letby's colleagues. Now, let me make it clear. This individual is not the one that we've just heard from in court. This is a completely separate individual but discussing the same set of circumstances. So you've got one of the triplets that have died and Lucy Letby's reaction to this. Now, in my mind, and I think this is what this lady's trying to portray or put across here, is that Lucy Letby couldn't wait to tell her colleague that this child had passed away. She pulls her into a separate room. Uh, I'll play the clip for you. You'll be able to see exactly what I mean. Take a listen to the following. You were working on the ward at that time when she carried out her final two murders. Yeah, so I worked, I'm pretty sure I was on the night before, and then I came back in for a night shift, and the first one had gone in the day. And yeah, I rush. I was obviously walking onto the ward with another member of staff, and she quickly rushed over as soon as we got through the door to pull the other member of staff into the kitchen because she'd been on the night before looking after the trip, one of the triplets. Um, what, what was she pulling that staff member over for? What, what did she...? Well, she just wanted to inform her before she arrived onto the ward, I suppose. But, yeah, I think for me, just... Like, there's obviously a camera looking at people coming into the ward. So she was obviously watching and I think for me, yeah, obviously, you you know, for, as a nurse, if I was looking after that baby, I've, I'd have, you know, wanted the politeness of being informed before it being in handover. But I probably would have just let the nurse just go, <laughs> get herself together first and then before the kind of ward meeting, just bring her in and then say this has happened in the day. So having heard that lady's version of events there and combining that with the other consultant who actually testified at Lucy Letby's trial 
I mean, the impression that I get is that Lucy Letby was someone during this time period, and bearing in mind we're talking about the same child who died here in both cases, are we looking at here someone who's just simply being over the top, who's actually taking pleasure in what is taking place here? You have the consultant saying, actually, I felt very uncomfortable by Lucy Letby's demeanour, the way that she was acting, almost as if she was taking pleasure. I mean, I guess that's what I take from the consultant statement, that she was very animated, very over the top. And that's the impression that I get listening to that lady there, that Lucy Letby couldn't wait to pull aside that colleague and inform them of the news. Now, ask yourself, is that just a coincidence? you've actually got two separate individuals there describing fairly similar circumstances. To me, it's very, very strange. Now let's discuss the topic of Lucy Letby predicting the events which were to follow, as in predicting the decline or the deaths of these children. Now some people will say, well, there's no proof that Lucy Letby did these things, these awful, tragic things. There's no proof. Lucy Letby is simply a persecuted individual. It's all a conspiracy. But then when you look at the finer details of this case, the countless occasions where Lucy Letby either falsified paperwork or text a friend and said, oh yeah, this child's declining, she's not looking great, this child's looking rubbish, or this child has a 50-50 chance of survival, when actually none of that was true. Lucy Letby was very, very subtle in the way that she did this, but she would often sow the seeds of doubt, shall we say, in her colleagues' minds by saying, yeah, this child looks really pale, or yeah, this child looked rubbish tonight, knowing very well what she planned to do to that child on her following shift. There were countless occasions where Lucy Letby would make a remark like that, yet when they looked at the charts of these children, they were absolutely fine, or they certainly weren't as bad was what Lucy Letby was making out to her colleagues. One instance of Lucy Letby predicting what was to come for a child is when the consultant in court said the following, a separate consultant, this is the consultant we heard from just a minute ago regarding what happened with child P and Lucy Letby's behaviour. And it said, Letby was said to have made the absolutely shocking comment ahead of a planned transfer of the infant to another hospital. The youngster continued to deteriorate as his heart rate and blood oxygen levels dropped and died less than four hours later before the move from the Countess of Chester Hospital could take place. Recalling the conversation with Lucy Letby, a consultant who could not be identified for legal reasons told Manchester Crown Court on Tuesday, March the 21st, quote, I just said, the transport team are going to be here soon, almost thinking out loud literally counting down the minutes before they arrived and desperately wanting this baby to get better. Staff nurse Lucy Letby then said, he's not leaving here alive, is he? Which I found absolutely shocking at the time. I said, don't say that, and left the room. Bearing in mind that child P, sadly later, went on to die. Now Letby was very subtle. She was almost setting the scene in a lot of these instances, but it was proven in court that Lucy Letby would sow the seeds of doubt in her colleagues' mind. She would message certain doctors or certain colleagues and say, yeah, this child's looking rubbish, this child's looking pale. Yet what she was saying didn't tally up with the medical reports, didn't tally up with the medical charts. So let's just say, for instance, Lucy Letby would send a text message at 10pm. And she said, I was in work earlier at 8 o'clock and this child looked rubbish. Well, they'd go back and look at the medical chart for around that time and they'd say, well, this child is completely stable. Why have you messaged that? So it was very subtle what Lucy Letby was doing. Very, very calculated, very cunning. She would set the scene that some of these children were actually deteriorating far worse than they actually were. Now, the way that Lucy Letby would cover this up would be almost feigning this over-the-top concern. I guess is the best way of putting it. Now, we've got that one example there of Lucy Letby saying he's not leaving here alive, is he, about baby P when he was due to be transferred. But then saying in text messages about baby P after child O had died, she put to her friends, worry as identical. She said in text that baby N was a haemophiliac, saying that the ward was all worried about it. And after Googling it, Lucy Letby said to her friends, it's a 50-50 chance of survival. 
So overall, Letby's predictions were a lot more subtle and more along the lines of actually setting the scene with her nurse friends by making a fuss about the baby's existing medical conditions. So as I say, in a lot of cases, with these children that had existing medical conditions, she would amplify and exaggerate these conditions to her friends. Then it would be obviously a little bit less shocking when these children then later deteriorate and pass away. This is also demonstrated to some degree with the interview conducted with Lindsay Artle. Now she discusses talking about her baby's condition on the ward where Lucy Letby just can't resist sticking her two pence in. Take a listen to the following. It was March time, so it was two, 30 weeks or so. Finished work um, and on the day we'd gone in to get monitored um, and they all came rushing in and it was a, an emergency C-section and it was done within like 10 minutes. <laughs> it was exciting, but it was nervous because you, you didn't hear a cry or anything. You don't hear anything. So it was a bit quite shocking and even even though I could see he's gone to the other side, I'd sent Alan, my husband, over to take a picture um, and the oxygen hadn't been flowing because there'd been a placenta eruption. So he obviously didn't look like himself. So they had to take him straight off. So I'd just seen him as they went out. And then I didn't see him later. He was born at 10 to 3 and I'd probably seen him about midnight that night. And Lucy Letby was working on the unit at the time. Uh, what dealing did you have with her? So um, relaying the information to my husband, of, literally of what the doctor had told me that morning um, of him, how he was getting on. Like I've um, said, she wasn't actually ACES nurse, but she was covering somebody's break, um, overheard our conversation and and felt the need to come over and tell us that um, I'm sorry I over, I overhearing a conversation but I, I don't like parents getting you know their hopes up too much because you never quite know what could happen now as a parent I absolutely erupted and was like furious like how dare you take that hope away from me and then as a professional I'm I'm saying to the matron and to herself that it was completely inappropriate to take somebody. You can't speak to people like that. I'm there when people get news terminal illnesses. Never once have I ever said, oh, well, you know, I wouldn't, wouldn't hold out too much hope, you know, because everyone needs hope. Do you think because you made that complaint about let be, the next day she took out her revenge? It made me feel quite guilty because there's two babies or possible in there, including my son, who um, could have been a victim of hers. So I feel guilty a little bit that I may have drove her onto or drove something to happen, a bit of anger. Um, you just feel so lost, so I don't know, really just it's, it's horrific to think of because you wouldn't think that nobody would be capable of that. People had their suspicions. Definitely, way before Asa was born. So Asa was born in March 2016 and when alarms would go off during the night especially, um, there would be um, a phrase that people would use, colleagues that I know have used, and are sort of commenting on, I wonder if Lucy's working tonight. What's your reaction now you know the guilty verdict? Then a guilty verdict is brilliant for the people who have got some sort of justice, it doesn't bring anyone back, but it gives some people some answers but it leaves many people who haven't had any answers. So that needs to happen, that needs to be looked into. People like you? Like me, there's many probably like me. And I'm hoping that me doing this is gonna help somebody and then for them to come and think maybe mine needs looking into as well, because they've got every right for them to be looked into. And if it doesn't come out and, it, and they're okay and they weren't involved, then great. But it needs to be looked at. So now let's touch upon the topic of falsifying records or falsifying paperwork, something which Lucy Letby appeared adept at. Now, many people say, oh, this is just a coincidence. She didn't mean to write that. You know, they're very busy and mistakes happen and all this stuff. But Lucy Letby was, as Mr. Johnson said in court, cooking the books. And there was a number of reasons for this. Basically, Lucy Letby would falsify the paperwork to make it appear that she may be somewhere else, that she may be looking after a different baby at a certain time period, that maybe a baby's condition was actually worse than what it was, that maybe a colleague had done something to the baby that they hadn't. Many, many reasons why Lucy Letby was falsifying paperwork. I'm just going to touch upon one example here. I do plan in the future to release a full video regarding all the instances 
of Lucy Letby's dodgy paperwork, but in this video, we're just going to focus on one. Now, this is in the case of Child I. Mr. Johnson, the prosecuting barrister, is talking about Lucy Letby's colleague, Ashley Hudson. Mr. Johnson says Ashley Hudson had given evidence to say Child I was very easy to settle, and although Child I was in nursery room one, that was as a precaution given her history of episodes. Child I was self-ventilating in air, and her saturations optimal, and she looked very well. She was pink, well-perfused, and had a soft, non-distended abdomen. Another colleague, Caroline Oakley, said in a statement, Child I's abdomen was fine and soft, non-distended. Mr Johnson says that is the background to Child I when Lucy Letby came on shift that night. Letby was designated nurse for a baby in room 2 and a baby in room 3. Ashley Hudson was designated nurse for Child I and another baby. Child I was in a virtually perfect clinical scenario, Mr Johnson tells the court. He says Letby then got herself involved. Child I gave a quote, cry that had not been heard before loud and relentless, according to Ashley Hudson, who interpreted it as distress. When she was repositioned on her tummy at about midnight, Child Eye stopped breathing. Resuscitation efforts began, and Child Eye then began to fight the ventilator. Dr John Gibbs was told Child Eye had had an abnormal cry. He was, quote, perplexed at Child Eye's rapid deterioration and recovery, which would not show a sign of infection. Mr Johnson says Letby falsified paperwork for one of her designated babies at this time, the baby to be transferred to Stoke. Letby recorded a note at 10.50 to 10.52pm, a note of 10% glucose infusion for the quote Stoke baby. The infusion note is written as starting at 2300, and that writing is changed to 2400. Mr Johnson says it was changed to give Letby an alibi for midnight. Mr Johnson says further times are overwritten and changed on Child Eye's infusion chart, from 12.15am to 12.25am, and one to a time at 1.25am, which Mr Johnson says put it out of sequence between 1.28am and 1.48am on the chart. Ashley Hudson said she was alerted to Child Eye at 1.06am by either the alarm going off or Child Eye crying. She said in room one, Letby was already there at Child Eye's cot side and had her hands in the incubator. Mr Johnson says Letby had sabotaged Child Eye and caused Child Eye to cry. Mr Johnson says Letby put Ashley Hudson off by saying, quote, she just needs to settle. Air plus plus was aspirated from Child Eye. Mr Johnson asks how that could have got there other than being forced in by Lucy Letby. Mr Johnson said Child Eye's case is a stark one. He says Letby made repeated efforts to kill Child Eye and falsified notes for both Child Eye and another baby. She gave herself away in the event with Ashley Hudson. Lucy Letby's behaviour in the aftermath of Child Eye's death was bizarre and inappropriate. She revelled in what she had done. So for many people, Lucy Letby didn't demonstrate any red flags. Yet I feel that I've demonstrated there just a number of Lucy Letby's behaviours which seem to tie in with this specific article here. I'll put a link to the full Psychology Today article down in the video description box below. But let's just cover again the following. From several of these studies and additional cases, we now know that nurses who endangered or killed a number of patients had multiple red flag behaviours. They might have gained macabre nicknames from patients or staff, were in rooms where unexpected deaths occurred and weren't assigned there, well we know that's the truth, were secretive or deceptive about innocuous things, liked to predict that a patient would die, were associated with suspicious incidents at different institutions, craved attention, hung around after a death to experience the reactions, lied about credentials or falsified their work records or medical access reports. They didn't operate fully under the radar colleagues notice them. Very, very interesting article. As I say, I'll put a link to that down in the video description box below.